Okay, then. Um, welcome, Rob Lutz, to uh, Music with Mr. D. Uh, glad to have you with us tonight. Thanks, Ken. Happy to be here. Okay, great. Um, there are a few folks in uh, Van Cleek Hill uh, that, uh, that know a little bit about you. They've heard about you or they've seen you in different performances and things, but um, I'd like to try and expand that. So what I normally do is with these interviews is I start with the question, so who is Rob Lutz? <sighs> Wow, man, there's so many levels to this. Or am I anybody? I don't even know. Well, I mean, uh, I guess I would say I'm, uh, uh, I was born in Toronto. I grew up in New Brunswick. I was in Toronto for about a year. My dad was a maritimer living. He was an accountant working in Toronto. We moved there. One of six kids grew up in New Brunswick in St. John or outside St. John. And I uh, grew up in a very musical family in terms of loving music. My mother played music, but I was basically the only uh, kid in my family that played. And I just you know, from a very early age, I just had this love of singing and uh, perf well, not performing, more playing. You know, I played piano and then I took up guitar and ukulele and um, just always found myself gravitating towards doing that. And uh, and essentially, you know, I say to people like, how did you stay a musician so long? And I say that, you know, most people play music at some point in their lives. And I said, I just never stopped. And I just kept working and trying to improve, you know, and getting better and better. And I and I love writing songs. So I'd say, who's Rob Lutz? He's a New Brunswicker living in Montreal for 30 years who, um, uh, you know, loves music and loves to write songs. Oh, great. Great. Um, so uh, so is this your main is this your main gig? Uh, music? Yes. Yeah. Main gig for many years. Yeah, it has. And it has been. And uh, I have done other things. I When I first came to Montreal, I have a, a daughter who's now 29 an older daughter, and uh, I came when she was born and, and uh, had an English degree and a journalism degree. I was playing music then, but I needed a regular gig. So I, I took a job as a writer, a staff writer at a publishing company in Montreal and um, worked there for 10 years and writing books. Basically, we would take contracts from big publishing companies in the U.S., like Time Life and Rodale and um, you know Smithsonian books, like different books about history, sports, DIY, uh, travel, camping, you name it. And we would prepare the book. So they would hire us. We'd, ha we'd have the staff. We'd write the book, do all the illustrations, everything. And then we'd deliver the book finished to them. They'd put their imprint on it and that was it. So I learned a lot about writing. I learned that the lesson, the most, the biggest lesson I learned there was hard writing makes easy reading. You know, you have to write, you have to work on your, your stuff so that people get it. And um, I think I brought that to songwriting. I work hard on my songs. Mm-hmm. I, I had a, an interview last week with um, with Brianna Doyle from Hudson, and she's okay. both a technical writer as well as a songwriter. And she was okay. basically saying the same thing, that the yeah. structure and everything that you need is pretty similar. Uh, the output is different, but the, the structure and everything is, uh, is yeah. similar, at least the structure that you use in the, in the writing of it. Yeah. The rigor, the rigor is, is what it is. I think it's the, you know, structure. Yeah. You need a beginning, a middle and an end. It needs to be coherent. I mean, not too coherent. Sometimes it's nice to leave people a little bit of ambiguity so they can go where they want with a song. But, you know, I don't like to leave people completely at odds. Like, what does this mean? You know? Yeah. And, yeah. or, or the other, and the other part of that is you don't want it to be absolutely regurgitated, hackneyed cliches. You know, you want to bring something novel and new to it. And you learn that. I mean, technical writing, I, I didn't quite get into technical, although DIY is close. And essentially what you're doing in many cases is rewriting. You know, you're writing about things that you may or may not have done. So you're taking like five different sources explaining how to like wire a plug or rewire a lamp or I'm looking around my room here and you have to kind of take little bits from all of them and assemble them into a coherent story that is original to you, but has all the facts that are contained everywhere else. And it's kind of like that is kind of like what story uh, songwriting is. Yeah. yeah. What, what would you say are your influences musically? I mean, a huge range of them. I uh, I grew up, I'm the youngest of six kids, so I was born in 68, and my siblings were all listening to, I have a sister who's 12 years older than me, and then siblings all the way to me, kind of spaced out. So, you know, all of the stuff from the 60s and early 70s, from the Beatles to the Bee Gees to uh, Lobo, I was thinking about Lobo the other day, you know, uh, the song uh, Me and You and a Dog Named Boo, one of the first mm -hmm. tunes ever. So all this kind of acoustic stuff that was kind of coming on the heels of the folk revival, the Peter, Paul and Mary Kingston trio stuff coming on the heels of that, but also all that early stuff. And then um, as I've gotten older... I kind of went through the 80s and 90s and stayed. I kind of, instead of coming forwards with music, I kind of went backwards. 
and I've dug further into history and uh, just done a huge amount of research into the history of blues and jazz and Tin Pan Alley and 19th century music. And so I'd say that the influences have been more that way in some ways as I've gotten older. Yeah. You're typically known as a folk guy though, right? I mean, people don't, cl it's hard to classify. I went to yeah. Europe, I had an agent there. I toured there three times and they classified me as blues. And mm -hmm. in Quebec, I've been sort of lumped in with a lot of blues players because I've done a little bit of blues. I do a lot of folk too. I call it roots because I really yeah. like to draw on everything. And that term doesn't work everywhere, but uh, it works okay in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. The, the roots Americana type thing, uh, uh, yeah. nomenclature kind of works, works uh, hand in hand. I guess, I guess I, I guess I get the, the feedback about you being a folk guy is that you, you, you are, you're often at folk festivals and, uh, or at least you have been in the past. Um, yeah. I think the first time I saw you perform was then they used to have a folk festival on the Lachine Canal for a couple of years. Yeah, they did. The, the yeah. festival Folk Sur Le Canal, yeah. Yeah. It's happening and again. It's coming back this year. Oh, that's good. Because I think you played there at least once. Because I, I think that's I where played I there every second year yeah. since they founded it. And I closed the very first one. So I am I was closely connected to that festival. And I'm glad that it's, it's going to come back because it's kind of grown into something really neat. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's that's that. I think that's the only time I've actually seen you perform live. Okay, uh, is that the is on the, is on the canal? So, right. uh, but you but you have had your share of recognition in terms of in terms of nom at least nominations for awards or awards yeah. that you've gone. You kind of give us a little insight into some of those. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I uh, was entering songs in some songwriting contests when I started kind of getting serious about this in the '90s, and I won a, a regional songwriting competition in Montreal called the Montreal Songwriting Competition. Mm -hmm. And then I, I had a friend here who played on my first album named Ray Bonneville, who was used to okay. live in Montreal. Yep. You may have heard of Ray. Right. He's moved yep. down to I, I th well, actually, he moved down to the states to Arkansas. Now he's back. He's living in uh, Canada, actually, um, in Ontario. But he went down in. Um, 99 and put a song into this thing called the Kerrville uh, New Folk Songwriting Competition. It's Kerrville Folk Festival, just a, an hour uh, west of Austin. Really important festival. You know, Lyle Lovett competed in it, Lucinda Williams, all these notable. So he told me to go down there. He won it. He was one of the winners. There's six winners. There's hundreds of applicants. And so I put a couple songs in uh, the year after, and I went down and I won it as, uh, same as him. The year after and uh, so that got me a little notoriety and then I've been nominated for a bunch of Maple Blues Awards which are Canadian National Blues yeah, Awards yeah. and I've been nominated for a bunch of Canadian Folk Music Awards I'm nominated for four my current album is nominated for four and the awards would be give, give, being given out in about two weeks um, and then you know a few others here and there along the way you know just different groups uh, there was a group in Quebec called Lee's Blues and there's a some Fran francophone groups in Quebec. So yeah, I've had a fair, fair bit of that. And really the only thing that does is get your name out there. I don't sure. think the awards, yeah. I think com competing for songwriting is not really a valid pursuit necessarily, yeah. but it does get recognition and get your name out there. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is Ray still, is Ray still performing? Oh yeah. Yeah. Ray's yeah. still going, man. He's uh, got an incredible steady output and, uh, and yeah, he's, he's still doing it. Absolutely. I saw, I saw him in Ottawa about, I don't know, maybe probably about seven or eight years ago. And it was one of the worst snowstorms we had had in a long, long time. And he oh, had wow. been coming from somewhere in New York. I don't remember, maybe oh, Syracuse. Okay. And he was driving up. And, of course, he had come up from the south. So right. he didn't have snow tires or anything. Oh. And and I, I remember looking out the window and my wife said, you can't go out in all that snow. I said, if he's driving from Syracuse, I right. can drive six blocks to where he's playing. And yeah. he put on a great show to not very many people, but it was a really great show. Right. I've been a Sometimes fan of those are the best shows, uh, those yeah. ones, those sort of happy accidents, you know, when it's very intimate, that can be really liberating for a performer like Ray. I'm sure he, I mean, I'm sure he wasn't happy that it wasn't full, but I'm sure he gave his, his full, yeah. you know? Well, it was great. The first thing he did is he called everybody down to the front rows. Like, oh, nice. I don't want to be singing to the back. And it, that just changed the whole evening. Yeah. completely. It was, it was really great. So oh, great. let's talk about your, this new project, Sussex. It's uh, a, yeah. it's a bit different, uh, uh, guitars and vibraphone. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's really different. yeah, it's um. Well, basically, the idea came from um, I grew up, as I said, I grew up in New Brunswick, a little town outside St. John called East Riverside, and I was very lucky because I had a group of friends in junior high school. There we have junior high and then high school um, uh, that were into music and all played music, and so we formed a band. We formed a band and we called it the Hippopotamus Waterfall. We called it that because we loved the Buffalo Springfield, which was uh, Neil Young and Stephen Stills, that early band. We all love that, that band. So we formed this band 
and our drummer was my best friend, Michael Emino. And um, he was, you know, loved the drums and everything. And then at about age of 13 or 12, he took up marimba and then vibraphone. And then he went on and did a degree at McGill in vibraphone and then went on to be a world-class player. He went to Japan. He lived in uh, the States in San Francisco for 10 years and in Paris for five years. And uh, so I was pursuing my career in roots and he was off around the world playing vibes. He moved back to Montreal in uh, 20, 2012, I think. And we were just hacking around together because we used to play together and, uh, you know, in that band. And we kind of, you know, we thought this is something cool about this. And um, other people kind of dug what we were doing. So we formed this band and, and it's actually him and I and then a rotating cast of some of Montreal's best players of various instruments um, playing with us in this kind of group. And uh, it's been really fun. We've done two records. We're working on a third one now. The current format is Michael and I and pedal steel and upright bass and mm -hmm. and the vibes and the pedal is really interesting together so and then and the album that we did previously was two horn players we had a trumpet flugelhorn player right. and we had a clarinet sax so anyway it's always morphing and again we're trying to channel this kind of older vibe it's original music for the most part but we're kind of channeling like a mix of jazz and blues and tin pan alley kind of songwriting and also just kind of some odd exploratory stuff so it's really really fun freeing and when we play live people tend to really have fun because it's not something they've seen very often yeah and so it ends up being a good time and, and michael and i you know because we're so old such old friends we have a pretty natural rapport and we can tell each other we're very, very honest with each other and uh so it, it's fun we enjoy it yeah, and that usually comes through in a performance as well. The the the, the how how close the the performers are to each other and uh, how much and they like each other that particular night. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's great. It's interesting as one of, one of the comments I was going to make here. I've got my little script here that the the folk guitar and vibraphone are not something we see every day, as you just uh, as as you just yeah. commented. Yeah. So um, so we're uh, as far as I know from uh, my look today, we're about half sold. Okay. um for the uh for the event so that's going to be great so so what are people going to hear um what they're going to hear is um a, a range of things they're going to hear some stuff uh, from both of our albums some original songs that we wrote i wrote mainly but we also co-wrote um they're going to hear some some songs that we're going to kind of give you a little taste of what it was that brought us to a song you know so if we're going to mm -hmm. play a song in a certain style sometimes we'll play an old song that kind of was the inspiration for that. So it can kind of draw some connections there, which is kind of yeah. fun. They're going to hear some, um, some I, I wouldn't say classic, but I'd say some, some gems from the history of music from older times, you know, not mm -hmm. a ton, but they'll hear a few of those. Sure. And, um, you know, from Michael, I mean, I, I'm a fingerstyle player and I'm, you know, a pretty good player. I've been playing a long time. And Michael's uh, like a phenomenal vibes player. And um, so he's created, a, you know, he, he can do some pretty neat things. And the other thing that he's done on his vibraphone, and this is going to sound technical, but I'll try to make it clear. A vibraphone is an acoustic instrument. It's a percussion mm -hmm. instrument, which has tubes. So you have these keys made of nickel, or they can be made of platinum, depending on how expensive it is. And then they have these tubes. And then at the top of the tubes, there are these rotating um, discs that basically give a vibraphone a, vib a vibrato sound, right? Oh, that's so Michael, much. okay. Yeah. And so it's mechanical and, uh, you know, with most of them, you plug them in or there, and there's also a pedal that makes you, gives you a damper, kind of like a piano, but Michael, so we were playing these gigs and, and I always thought there's such a range of possibilities for this thing. And in credit to Michael, he's, he's, he's one, when he gets an idea, he really falls through. So what he did was he removed all the tubes from the vibraphone and he's playing an old Deegan vibraphone, which is a vibraphone that was used. If you listen to old Motown. This is the kind of vibraphone. If you listen carefully to Motown, there's tons of vibes and yeah. on that music, just mixed in, you know? Anyway, took off the tubes, so it's acoustically quieter. But then he put a, put a piezo pickup, so like a guitar pickup kind of thing, little microphone on each one of the keys of the vibraphone. And so now he has an electronic pickup on each one, and then he routed all of those pickups out into one sing signal, okay? And he plugs that into a pedal board. So then he has a range of sounds that he can do with this vibraphone. So he can take it from a, a traditional acoustic Lionel Hampton jazz vibe sound to it can make it sound like a million things. So, you know, he'll sometimes play with that during the show and give you kind of a sonic soundscape thing, which is kind of fun, too. And we do that in some of the tunes. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, that that'll be very interesting. Because, and and some of the uh, the the music that I've been listening to, uh, that's on SoundCloud or wherever it was that I found it. Um, I guess a lot of it is the the the, the group with with the horns and everything. And yeah. sometimes the 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 vibraphone gets lost a little bit with all the uh, with all the yeah. big blasting horns. Sure. So it's going to be really interesting to see it oh, in yeah. such a clean uh, uh, in such a clean state. So. You'll have lots of vibes. I mean, you know, but the beauty of it is that with the way he's playing it, it it it's a little bit, it's a bit of variety. You know, it's not just that standard vibe sound. So you get a little bit of variety mm-hmm. in there. And he also plays the pianica during the show, which is, uh, you know, this handheld, basically an organ you blow in, a piano keyboard yeah. you blow yeah. in. And he plays that. And I play a little banjo um on some tunes and so we mix it up a little bit and we have a little fun and and you know what honestly like we're coming back after we did play a fair bit during covid even even though it was covid we have a great agency here and we were doing we're fairly active actually i mean relatively not like normal we're coming back to it and so we're also you know we're coming back to it like the audiences are so we're finding things and we're having some fun and it's kind of it's very fresh at this point on stage so they might see something you know we might do something that we're not normally doing and i might not predict so uh sure. that's you know been happening so and, and and honestly that's what i like about sussex it's very it's kind of free that way you can kind of go places and musically and it's yeah. fun i i'm really looking forward to it because i uh, one thing about where you're going to be playing everybody loves that room every musician that we've ever had there loves the room because the sound is absolutely fantastic and i can't yeah. wait to hear the vibraphone in yeah. that in, yeah. in that uh, in that room so uh, so we're uh, we're really looking uh, we're really looking forward to it um I want to thank you for your time uh, to, yep. today uh, do, doing this, and uh, and I can tell you that the uh, the momentum is building. I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to sell out the house um, by yep. the time it, uh, Tuesday comes around, and uh, uh, and it's going to be uh, I'm looking forward to a, a really great evening. It's so, going to be a lot of fun, and thank you very much, Ken, for doing this and for doing the show as well. I appreciate it. All right, all right. thanks very much. Okay.